Hello. So, this video we are covering factor by grouping. This is one of those things that shows up sort of unexpectedly in several different areas. Uh, so we're going to go through it in sort of a particular sort of classic formation with cubics, but it'll show up again in some other videos and stuff as we go. Okay? So, what is factor by grouping? So, let's say we have some sort of uh, polynomial like this one here, a nice cubic. In particular, it's sort of useful, sort of most typically to have four terms, but technically any number of terms that is composite, meaning four, six, eight, something can break into sort of multiple pieces evenly. That's sort of the, the place where grouping comes in, okay? All right, so step one, we wanna group the terms. So what do we mean by that? Well, each group, we're basically separating these terms into sort of different you know, pieces, and each one has to have the same number of terms. That's why I was saying number, you know, if you have four terms, it's nice because you can do two groups of two, for example. Each of those terms in the original polynomial has to be in a group. So you can't just sort of group some stuff and leave stuff out. That's not going to work for you. This is why doing something with, say, five terms is difficult because you can't do, like, two, two, and have one just sitting alone. That's not going to work. You have to break it up into even-sized pieces. So here with our given polynomial, we can break it up like this, right? So we have the, the first two terms sort of grouped together. I'm just throwing parentheses around it so that I'm sort of signifying that that's the plan. And the last two terms are together. Now, it's worth a note here that technically speaking, right, heavy air quotes here, technically speaking, how you group these won't matter. It will always factor if it's going to factor or won't if it won't factor. But... Heavy air quotes because most of the time there's sort of one way where it factors very obviously and cleanly, one way where a human could probably do it if they thought about it for a while, and at least one way where a human has almost no hope of doing it unless they're really good. So there's sort of the obvious way and then a bunch of other ways you probably don't want. So I mention this because if you group it one way and you can't see sort of how to make it work, try another way, maybe at least one other one, because it might just be you sort of grouped it in a way that it really wasn't obvious. But chances are good if there's sort of no way to do it after your second grouping, it probably just isn't going to factor by grouping, okay? All right, so we break these apart into even-sized groups. Here we have two groups of two. Next. So now we want to factor out the greatest common factor of each group, okay? So here, I would look at this sort of first group here and pull out whatever the greatest common factor of these two terms is. And then same with the last two terms, pull out the greatest common factor there. So doing that, I would pull out my 3x squared from that first one, right? So that would leave me with just an x in the first term and a minus 2 in the second. And then I'd pull out that 17 from the second one, the second group. And that would also leave me with x minus 2. Now, this is actually really important to notice. And in fact, it's sort of step three. We want to verify that what's left over is exactly the same thing in both cases. So here, I want to notice that I have x minus 2 left over and x minus 2 left over. And in fact, that's sort of necessary. So if that is the case, right, if we do have the same thing, we can factor that out sort of as a single piece. But if we don't, that means grouping failed, okay? So to be very, very clear, what you want to do is look for some sort of whatever the remainder is and verify that, yes, indeed, that is the same thing. Otherwise, you can't really go to the next step. You have to go back and try some other method, some other grouping, something like that, okay? Sort of beating a dead horse here because this is the number one place where students go wrong is they sort of just do the grouping and assume it worked and don't actually check that these are the same thing. And if you sort of proceed when they aren't the same thing, you are guaranteed to get a wrong answer. Like, you can't ever get the right answer. So, very clear, we want those remainders to be the same. So then, we get this sort of factored piece. The idea is that we take that remainder, that x minus 2, and we pull it out as if it were a factor, like it were the 3x squared or like it was the 17, and that leaves some remainder bit from those given terms. So in particular, right, the 3x squared is going to be left over and the plus 17 is left over when we pull out that x minus 2. And so what happens is the x minus 2 comes out front and each of those other pieces sort of go down and become the other part, okay? So again, to be very clear, the x minus 2, we factor both of those out to get this piece and then what's left over in each, like the 3x squared and then the plus 17 become the other part, okay?
So this is the result of factor by grouping. This is the, sort of the end of the grouping step. But to be very clear, just because you've succeeded at the factor by grouping does not necessarily mean you are fully factored, right? If you remember, linear terms, terms of degree one, like this x minus two, always factored fully. We don't have to look at that. But if you have a square term, right, that might be fully factored. It might not be fully factored. You have to actually check. As it turns out, in this case, this one is fully factored. So I would be done if my, if my goal is to fully factor. My goal is just to factor by grouping. It doesn't really matter if that's done because I've done the grouping step, okay? All right, so let's look at another example. Let's say we have something like our Q of X here, right? This another sort of nice cubic has four terms, okay? So step one, we wanna group them. Again, we can sort of group them in a number of different ways. Most of the time, it's sort of easiest to, group, to sort of group them in the obvious way, right? The first two together and the last two together. So here, that's exactly what I'm gonna do. Group the first two terms together and the third and fourth term together. Now I'm gonna to wanna to do the greatest common factor, right? Pull out of, of each. So in the first part, I could pull out, for example, three X squared, and that would give me a negative X and a five, but I usually like to have positive leading terms. So I'm gonna pull out the negative along with it. And for the same reason, because I like to, right? The goal is to have the same thing left over. If I'm gonna pull a negative out to make the first term here positive, I should definitely pull out the negative here to make sure that the first term there is positive. So I'm gonna pull out a negative 3x squared and a negative one, and that gets me here, right? So I pull out the negative 3x squared, that leaves the x left over, and it flips the sign, right? So I get a five left over. And here I'm pulling out a negative one, which just flips both signs. So I get x and minus five. Again, the important part here, right, is to make sure that I have the same thing, x minus five and x minus five. If, for example, I only pulled out the negative 3x squared and I left the other one alone and I was like, ah, oh, I'm, I'm close, but I'm not there, right? I have x minus five and minus x plus five. You could take a moment to see like I'm close, but the signs are off. What happens if I pull out a negative one to see if you can make the signs match and make it work, okay? So here it works. I have x minus five on both, so I factor that out, right? So I factor out both x minus fives to get the leading x minus five. And that leaves me with this part left over, the minus 3x squared and the minus one. So I have negative 3x squared plus negative one. Now I could write that as just x minus five times the negative 3x squared minus one. This is perfectly legitimate and sort of a perfectly fair final form, if you will. Some people like having positive leading terms and as sort of often as they can. And so some people will factor out the negative in that second term because both terms are negative, making sure that you get a sort of positive 3x squared. So you could also write this negative x minus five, 3x squared plus one. But to be very clear, uh, even from sort of my standpoint or the standpoint of any math person, uh, these two sort of forms are entirely equivalent. There's no reason to have one over the other other than like personal preference or if there's some other aspect to what you're dealing with where you want, you know, for some reason to have that negative get pulled out, like you were gonna cancel it against something or whatever. So I'm not saying that you need to do that. It's just an option if you wanna do that, okay? All right, so what do we do? Well, we talked about factor by grouping. In fact, as I mentioned, this thing's gonna come up in a few other places as we'll see. But the idea of factor by grouping is to make sure that you have some sort of nice number of terms that you can split up evenly. So for example, four terms, you can split it into two groups of two. Then you group them together however you want. Again, typically the first and second and the third and fourth sort of paired up together if you have four terms. And then factor out common factors. Hopefully you have the same thing, factor out that same thing, leaving the common factors behind. And that gives you a, a factored form which you may have to then check to make sure it's fully factored if that's your goal, okay? So that is that.